Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You're about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Welcome, everybody. I uh, really appreciate y'all coming uh, to uh, Eureka Springs here today. I know it's not an easy track to get to this awesome little town. It is, uh, <laughs> no matter where you're coming from, it's, uh, it's quite a trip. And uh, I really appreciate uh, everybody being here. Feel free to take as many photos as you want. Uh, video, post it online, send it to your family randomly, and they're like, what the hell are you sending me that picture for? Just do it, late at night, just strange pictures from the building, whatever you would like. Um, after uh, we do Real Ghost Stories Online, which we're gonna do for about an hour, and I have uh, a list of folks who have uh, emailed me after they got their tickets, saying, I'd like to share my story, so I'm gonna go down this list, and I hope we can get through all of them. Uh, I will do my darndest. Uh, after we get through that, if we do, I'll open it up if anybody else wants to share their story. Uh, and uh, then uh, between the two shows, we'll do some more pictures, hang out, chat a little bit, uh, maybe a little Q&A, and then at 9 o'clock, uh, Keith will join us uh, for an episode of The Great Talks. And uh, he's right over there, and his book is over there too, I believe, right? Keith? So be sure to check that out. And we will learn the history of this awesome place called the Crescent Hotel and all of its ghosts. I'm, I'm very excited. So uh, I have no sound effects to play or any screams or weird noises. I guess we could do that. Yeah. Just look at us and we'll go, ah! We could be like the show, just in the background, somebody has to do a really little hum. It's like, yeah, the acapella. That's okay, Jen, I got you. I can do it. Okay, I'll do the hum. You can do a hum. Stuff. And then Tony will still randomly sing Michael McDonald's. <laughs> it's kind of like two pets. A cute Yeah, just randomly. Yeah, so. All right, well, this is the chair uh, for whoever is going to be coming up and sharing your story. So when we uh, call you up, come on up. I got a microphone right here for you. And uh, just uh, so you know, when you talk to the mic, kind of close. Uh, Turn it on. Be kind of close. There we go. Be kind of close like that, and uh, you'll be able to be picked up on the mics. Everyone can hear you. So we can sit down, get comfy. Beverages back there. Make sure you uh, get stocked up and uh, enjoy. Uh, our first individual to come up and share their story with us tonight, Stacy. Come on down. Don't hide, you're getting ready to be in that stage. <laughs> they can all see you. She's had like four bourbons already. She's, 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 I need more liquid courage. She's good to go. All right, uh, Stacy. so um, now pretend you're on a phone and make the sound effects, maybe cut out a few times randomly, uh, and we'll make it really authentic. But, but go ahead, let's hear your ghost story. It's a uh, haunting in Bozeman is what yeah. I uh, saw. Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, um, this isn't. This is my sister's story, so I didn't experience this myself, but she told it to me, and she was visiting my brother, who both of them are complete no-nonsense people, so when she told me this, it was, it was really scary. So it goes like this. <laughs> my brother and his wife live in Montana, and a few years ago, experienced some very unsettling events in their home. In 2008, my sister Molly, the youngest of us three kids, was visiting them for a few weeks and arrived on a Saturday. My sister-in-law, Katie, told Molly about some of the unusual happenings in the home, which included bumps and thumps coming from the upstairs and a man's voice that Katie overheard in the middle of the night. Apparently, he said, Hi, this is Bill. When she heard him, she was frozen, unable to move or talk, and felt a buzzing sensation throughout her body. And another night, she was again awakened, again unable to move or speak, and she heard a woman's voice say, look, her lips are quivering. Katie said that the voice sounded very proud of the fact that she was afraid. So my sister went to sleep with the lights on. She woke up around 4.30 a.m. on Sunday, felt silly for keeping the lights on, so she got up and turned them off. Upon returning to bed, about 20 or 30 seconds passed, and suddenly she felt 
as if her body was conducting some kind of electricity. And she was unable to move or speak, just as Katie had been. There was also a low tone buzzing in the room. Molly saw a man at the foot of her bed. Scared to death, she tried to ask him, who are you and what are you doing here? But when she went to form words, all that came out of her mouth were gasps. The man looked to be in his 60s, was slightly balding, and she could make out that he had on a button-down shirt and his hands in his pockets. Most of the figure was relatively dim, but his mouth and nose appeared to have a glow to them. He said to her, well, I was just up here. Page two. It's very humid, so they're sticking together. <laughs> the night after that, my freaked out sister checked into a hotel. <laughs> after catching her breath, she returned to my brother's home the following day, but made sure she had my brother's dog in the room with her at night. By the way, I brought my dog here because I do not want to be alone in that room. And I will put the sticker on. Has, has your dog sensed any? Have you been in your room yet? She's been sleeping. Okay. I walked her, so she's okay. Okay. Out. So that's a good sign. Maybe. <laughs> the dog laid there staring at the door the entire night. Both Katie and my brother and Molly again felt their bed shaking in their rooms that night. And Katie heard the same male voice but this time, it was mumbling incoherently. They thought that perhaps these entities followed them back from the piece of property where they were building their new home. The old farmhouse that was on the property was moved to make room for the new home. I sent them some sage to burn in the corners of the house, but other than that, I couldn't offer them much advice other than move. <laughs> That's good. That's good advice. Right? I would have moved. Katie continued to experience things in the home, including kitchen cabinets opening and closing at random when no one else was home. Since they moved to their new home, even though it is in the location of the old farmhouse, they have not had any further supernatural experiences. This was the advice I was given from an intuitive at the time of the haunting. Yes, they are real experiences and real people. The intent is not to scare, the individuals are just doing what they can to be heard and seen and apparently are a bit more adept at the process than others. They are also very attached to their property and those who live there, but it doesn't have to be a negative process. This happens everywhere. Any place that has been inhabited can have a residual energy or attract a complementary energy once a connection has been made. You are right, moving is not necessarily the answer. Both sides need boundaries. Death is not an ending, it is a shifting of energy from manifest plane to spirit plane. They are in between at the moment. What happens next will be a matter of negotiating what they need from this contact. They are trying to be heard and apparently thrilled that they are able to make contact. It can be very disconcerting to the living when it isn't something you even know exists. It isn't about harm, it is about getting someone to know and notice that they are present. Something is unresolved. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thoughts? You know, I kind of wonder about these particular ghosts. It sounds like with the um, almost electric charge that they gave off, if some ghosts are empowered more by electric charge and some are more conducted by water. Because, you know, when you walk in a room, or at least when we were kids and you walked in a room and you hadn't seen the TV screen, you could still tell it was on because you could hear that kind of hum, it's almost, that's what I'm imagining that she was hearing. Yeah, and I had her call in one time to the show, and I think you said that her experience was the closest you could get to your experience of a sleep paralysis with that buzzing. Oh, yeah, yeah. That yes, yeah. I remember that, because, yeah, my uh, my experience, and everybody's probably heard it 32 times now, because um, I'm probably sure about once a week. Yes. Somewhere down there, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, where I was in my apartment, and then it felt like something was going through me. And it was, yeah, it was freaky. But, but that, but she, I remember that. She, the, she did describe it as clear as, as I had felt it. So it was uh, interesting just to, when you hear that, it's, it's cathartic. It's like, oh my God, someone else has had that same thing. Because I hear people say, you know, sleep paralysis and that. And a lot of times that doesn't really describe it what I thought I had felt. So, anyway. I kind of like how, you know, a lot of times we'll hear a story and then Tony says thoughts. 
and you provided the closure for yeah. that. Like, you did all the work. Yeah. Like, well, you I, don't even have to speculate. I knew this woman, she works at a radio station actually in Kansas City, or she used to. And she wrote a whole book about uh, communicating with nightlights. And I met her before I was into any of this stuff, and I just thought she was kind of crazy. But she could be. She could be. She's but she's radio. the one that Insane. I reached out to because she's the only one I knew who had experience, and that's what she told me. And I thought, well, that's actually pretty. I think it's pretty profound, actually. Yeah. yeah. So. And then give me a copy of that, and then next time we're doing a podcast, you say thoughts. I'm just going to read that shit. And we're going to have completely <laughs> different thoughts. Completely, completely different thoughts on the next episode. Uh, and you'll Stacey. be like, that's my thoughts. <laughs> give Stacey a hand, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for coming up. All right. Uh, Kara. Kara McKenzie. You signed up, you can't get out of this. Wait, she signed up and now, did she really just say I don't want to? And you signed up voluntarily. Oh, we all volunteered her? Oh, that's so me. There you go. It's your hazing, I guess. That was me and them. They're not your friends. They're not your friends. No, they're my family. That makes me that's worse. Exactly. It's even more of a nightmare right there. Yeah, all right. Uh, freaky figure is what you said. So let's hear it. What happened? Okay, so I'm a huge like UT fan and my stepdad is not. And his mom passed away probably like four years ago, so he gives me this piggy bank thing that she made. It's like a UT football player. And so I put it in my room, and I was like, okay, thanks, you know, whatever. Well, when he gave it to me, every night at 3 a.m., it would wake me up. I'd say it. I don't know what would. I would just wake up out of a dead sleep, and then, like, I couldn't go back to sleep. And so I told my mom about it, and she was like, oh, it's nothing. So I let her put it in her room, and she woke up every day at 3 in the morning. And so I told her, I was like, we gotta get rid of this thing. Like, I, we gotta get rid of it. And so she put it outside in the car one night before she could take it back to my stepdad. And the dogs barked all night long at that thing. Like, I don't even know what it was. So then I have a friend who's like really big into crystals and all this stuff. So she's like, bring it over. We're gonna, we're gonna play with the Ouija board, which is something I do not. Oh, that's just a stupid idea. Yes. <laughs> It's almost BG Awareness Month, yes. And, and so I, I was like, whatever. Never even played with one. I was like, okay, whatever. So I thought she was messing with me the whole time. And so she's asking me questions. It's not doing anything. So then she's like, well, what's your name? And it spells out Linda. I was like, okay, like Amber, you're playing a joke on me. I didn't even know that his, what his mom's name was, and it was Linda. And she doesn't even know him, so I don't know how we would have got that answer. But like I said, I don't know anything about it. So we didn't close out the board. And we, I went home. Everyone died. Like, oh. like, whatever. She went home and, like, I went home. She went to bed and she called me the next morning and she was, like, freaking out. She was like, I had the weirdest dreams all night long. She was like, something was waking me up and it was, like, pulling me off the bed in my dream. And she was like, it, she was like, it was probably just, I freaked myself out. And then she had, like, two handprint bruises on her lips. Like, I have the picture on her ankles. Like, it looks like somebody had grabbed her that night. So I guess that was my bad Ouija board experience and I will never touch one again because I just thought they were just like a joke. I was just like, we're glad yeah. you learned your lesson. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when my stepdad took it back, it's been nothing. Like I sleep like a baby. It doesn't bother me at all. I think she just wanted to go home, if I'm being honest. Like I think she just wanted to go back where she came from. And this all started with, it was a bank? Or it was like a piggy a bank. piggy bank. Like a ceramic piggy bank. And you refer to it as a she wanted to Well, go his home? mom made it, and she okay. passed away. And so he gave it to me. What did it look like? It was just like this little football player. And it was like hand-painted. Like, she made it in like the 60s. It was just like, just this just, little just, It just kind of cracks me up, a haunted little pinky Yeah, pink exactly. So when you get to like the University of Texas. I told everybody about it, and they're like, you're, no. Like, that you're making it up. I'm like, no. Like, it started when I got it, and it, when it left, it didn't bother me anymore. And then her family members, don't ever let her get that damn Ouija board out again. Like, seriously. <laughs> no, they told me to get her, like, uh, you're not supposed to, like, you don't mess with that. I was like, I don't know anything about them. Like, I just thought it was like, okay, like, it's a joke, but I guess it's fine. <laughs> I learned my lesson, okay? <laughs> Do you think it, it, that, that things like that where you have a, uh, it's like it was initiated with this, this bank, right. this pre-Ouija board at the time, that when you then go and use the Ouija board, that, that can like essentially say, oh yes, it's like turning it on. It's like you know the product is there, and then it's like putting batteries in it. 
just having the piggy bank is like it's plugged in and you hit the power button with the Ouija board. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping that what came through was really what was going on with the Right, because you said it all went away when you got rid of the bank. When he took it back home to his mom's house, it never came. Did and not. Like, I sleep like a baby. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's lucky. Yeah. yeah. But the Ouija board, like, came from, like, she bought it from Walmart and everything. Like, I was just being really, really like, it's not a big deal. Like, she doesn't even know. And, the um, Walmart ones are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> oh my you gotta God. get it at Target. I mean, right? those are the ones. You want to get some real creepy shit. I thought maybe yeah. if it was, like, an old one, like, you know, that's, like, super old or something. Like, this was like brand new. Like, nobody had ever messed with it. We did not even know what we were doing, obviously. So do you think she was just all mad that, like, I love the University of Texas and no one can have my stuff. Could be, give me some angry like, sports right Like, what's up with that? I don't know, but I'm, I'm not haunted anymore, I guess, if that's what that was. <laughs> I just say that's what that was, but I mean, it's just a coincidence that everyone like, yeah. I guess. Well, it seems but, to be connected, definitely. Kara, thanks for coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So does it, uh, Keith, does this hotel have a no Ouija board policy in the rooms? I know some, some historic hotels do. No Ouija boards. All right, so sorry if you brought your Ouija boards. No using them tonight, everybody. We used to sell them in the gift store and just stop. Thank you. That's a really good decision. Good idea. I was going to ask this earlier, but I forgot. I'm curious. Uh, where everybody is from, who, who thinks they're furthest away? Raise your hand and we'll just kind of... Yes. New Mexico, Chicago, Chicago. Minnesota, Minnesota. California. California, I think, is in the lead. Yeah. Anyone else? Tennessee. 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 There too. You guys Chernobyl in the right back. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> that guy's gone. Now. That's weird. <laughs> this is actually the room where uh, we had something. Yeah. We had an experience here. It was great. Uh, it was, I think I've shared this once, uh, or eight times, uh, where uh, we, uh, we were just in town going around, and uh, for the longest time, you did not want to set foot in this building. You were a little kind of freaked out by the stories. And uh, we were just about to leave, and we're like, well, let's get breakfast somewhere, and we're just heading out of town, and you said, well, you want to go to the Crescent? So I knew how much you wanted to come here. <laughs> and I thought, okay. You really wanted to know. No, I didn't. I, I've seen all the scary stuff about, so I was scared. But I thought uh, this would be a real act of love to yeah. let you come have breakfast here. <laughs> so we did that, and uh, sure as shit, something happened. <laughs> we were sitting right over there, and uh, the uh, you got to pay. You, know, you put your credit card in the little envelope thing. They set it on the bar right back there. And we're just sitting here, just looking out over the eggs, Benedict, and bacon. And uh, all of a sudden, the credit card flies out of the envelope just across the room. From the folder. From just the folder. about halfway underneath the buffet table. Nobody touched it. Landed in the eggs, Benedict. And yeah, and what credit up. card was it you were using that It day? was the Real Ghost Stories Online uh, business card. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. there you go. Creepy stuff. <laughs> Got home. The cat had bite marks on it, don't you? <laughs> and Harper had blood on her. It was really weird. It was like, I know we can't leave kids and cats alone for a, a weekend, but... <laughs> God. <laughs> Kidding, they're not alone. Grandparents are there. Uh, Crystal, uh, antique shop spirits. Crystal. All right. Here you go. Hi. So, Hi. antique shop spirits. Yeah. Let's uh, hear it. Okay, so I live in Chicago, but my friend owns an antique store here in Arkansas, <clears throat> not too far away. It shall remain unnamed, but you can't throw a dead cat out the car without hitting an antique shop, so and not anonymity isn't a problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, okay, so um, most of the activity has been associated, she thinks, with items because it kind of comes and goes. Uh, so just out of the blue, uh, after she moved into her shop, she was having some activity. Um, so one night she was at, in the office late doing payroll and the printer just started spitting out a bunch of blank pieces of paper and then on like the very last page of 20, there was just like a little smiley face. <laughs> yeah, it's creepy. Um, but she didn't get like a malevolent vibe from it and like the water would turn on, she would hear hey, things of that nature. Um, it went on, for, I guess, for like a couple weeks, and then uh, one day this lady came in uh, just to shop her, and she um, bought some stuff and left, and then my friend got an email later, and she, um, from the 
lady. The lady said, hey, I hope this isn't weird, but when I was in your store, I got the initials AJ. And she's like, no, that's not weird. Maybe that explains some of the activity that's been going on here. And so then a couple more weeks pass, and my friend, she's, um, um, somebody buys this trunk, and so it's just standard protocol to kind of open up the trunk, make sure there's nothing in there. And when she opens up the trunk, the, initial, the initials AJ are in there, the initials that the lady had said she was picking up on. And then after the trunk was sold, there was no more activity. Um, and it's also in an old upholstery building, so um, like we'll FaceTime and occasionally I'll hear like little hammering like in the ceiling, and I'm just glad I'm like removed from that situation. Like <laughs> I would rather just hear it over video. Is is she hearing the hammering, or is it, are you just picking it up on your end of the FaceTime? No, both. Okay. Yeah, so she'll stop and she'll say, did you hear that? Okay. Yeah, of course. Um, and most of the activity has been pretty uh, benign, but there was one set of items that, so the way that the antique store is done is she rents out booths, so she doesn't personally go and pick up items. Um, and so one of her vendors went to an estate sale, which is where they pick up a lot of items usually, and so the vendor went out and the estate was kind of, had like a creepy vibe, so it was the son running it, and he was really aloof. Uh, the vendor would try and ask him questions, and he was just like, whatever. You got the vibe that it wasn't a very happy parental-child relationship. And um, there was a lot of, I guess, things that caught reflections, like mirrors and shiny dressers, and when they were loading in the truck, they would catch like flashes of faces, but when they would turn around, there was nothing there. And the son just really wanted to offload it. Well, these items sat, and they were good, they were good stuff, um, but it just sat in this booth just emanating this nasty vibe, and I don't know how it happened, but uh, one of her friends came by and, I don't know, ascertained that these needed to be cleansed, and so um, she came to the shop, she cleansed the items, and my friend went to give her a hug, and her friend is like, no, I need to, to dump all this nasty energy, and then she just left, and after that cleansing, the item sold. Now you want to find out who bought it and what's going on there. Yeah, definitely. Well, I know where, where that was because I hit a lot of antique stores. <laughs> so she knows what ones not to go to. Yeah. <laughs> One of them is an old buffet table that I know was bought as like a baby changing table, so that's messed up. <laughs> Could you repurpose a baby changing table into like a, a coffee table of some sort? Or? I, I don't think so. Okay. No. I mean, you could. Because you're talented, but do you want to? Well, it just depends on the shape of it, Dory. You could have it, like, supported by a bank that's a football player. <laughs> it's going to be looking, all these items I'm going to be looking out for now. You asked, we went to some antique stores today, and are like, what are you hunting for? Nothing. But now i got this whole list of stuff. I'm like, look! The bank! <laughs> so, thank you for coming out. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, it's kind of interesting, I was thinking about this as we're all here in this room together, because obviously we're normally not in a room together. At the beginning of us doing this show, the, the joke was group therapy for the paranormally affected. Welcome to group therapy for the paranormally affected. <laughs> uh, no judgments at all uh, here. So, uh, Shelly, uh, Haunted Hospital is... <laughs> Nothing oh. ever goes wrong with Haunted Hospital stories. Come on down, you're the next contestant. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this hospital that I worked in, I no longer work there. I left about three months ago, but it's about an hour south of Wichita. Okay. I won't name it, but. You can tell me later since I, I will think tell I you know later. which one. <laughs> it's almost 100 years old, not quite. Um, I definitely know which one. And a wealthy benefactor left a bunch of money to the town to specifically build this hospital. So that's what they did. And now, um, he's like, whisper it to me. <laughs> the, um, the unit where I worked, uh, my office, so all of the offices up there are old patient rooms. And so there's a bathroom in between each set of rooms. And um, the nurse manager, her office was across the hall from mine. And I kid you not, Every single time I was there working late by myself, and they told me this happened, but I don't know, that's not the same as it actually happening. I would walk in that office to get something off the printer or whatever, and the toilet would flush or the water would turn on, and 
there's no way, I mean, when you walk in the room, you're nowhere near the door of the bathroom. So one night I was there late and I heard it come on and I thought, I'm gonna go ask, you know, so-and-so down the hall, you know, who's still there, she's been in there. And she was like, no, I haven't been in there. And so we walked in there, we stood in front of that sink, I kid you not, five minutes dancing in front of that sensor and we could not get the water to come on, it would not come on. But it came on by itself five minutes before. But the crown jewel of what happened to me was um, one day when we went to do a dressing change uh, in a patient room, which is on the other end of the hospital. And I heard stories about this hospital being haunted. I heard that, like the OB unit, you know, they've seen on third shift, of course, it's the night shift, they've seen like a, a full bodied apparition walk off the elevator and all kinds of other stories. But um, anyway, so I was, it was me and the nurse manager, and we went to do a dressing change on the floor. So in the room where I was at, I was standing at the kind of at the foot of the bed on the side. The patient's bed is right here. The other nurse was at the foot of the bed, and then the patient's husband was sitting across from me, and then behind me was the door. So I'm just an extra pair of hands, right? I'm not really doing a whole lot, and I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, I, the hair on the back of my neck just stood up. And I have never felt that before. You read it all the time, but I've never felt that. It was like somebody was behind me just barely breathing on my neck. And then all of a sudden, like somebody yanked on the top of them on the yeah. back collar of my screen. <laughs> and I don't know how I managed it, but I just kept my mouth shut and we left the room and I was like, holy shit, you're not gonna believe what just happened to me. <laughs> That's a distinct feeling. It's not like, oh, that was an eerie draft or something. No, no, and you almost freeze when that hair stands up. It's like, I can't move. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, it, was, it was the first thing that's ever happened to me and I was like, yay, I'm having experience. <laughs> Did you say, is this an old building? Is this an old Yeah, the whole hospital is really old. You know, and when I was first there, I had opened my office window one day. I mean, you know, in a hospital, I mean, they'll only open this far. They're almost like casement windows, you know, they open like a book. And one day, that thing slammed shut. I mean, hard. And I, and I opened it back up, I stuck my arm out the window, <laughs> and I couldn't feel any wind. Yeah. So I don't know, I, I still don't know. I mean, you could say, okay, maybe a breeze came up. But sure swirled around and then slammed it, but I don't know. That place is, yeah, it's full of, yeah. That's always interesting to me about hospitals because you, you know, you don't spend a lot of time in them, you know, for the most part, um, you know, in, in life. So if, if you pass, who is it that is haunting? Is it the people who have passed that are confused and they're wandering around? Uh, is it just, you know, the energy of, you know, those, the living that, that are, you know, going through the grieving process, the stress process, is, it, is that energy causing other things to come in? I've, also, I've often wondered about like doctors and nurses that love what they did, and then once they're gone, they don't know what to do, so they go back. But was it always a hospital, or was it a mental hospital at one time? No, as far as I know, it was never a mental hospital. I think it's so sad. Not only are you in the hospital, but you're in the haunted hospital. That would suck. <laughs> and then, like, if I, when Tony and I have talked about this before, like, if you die, what are your ghost clothes going to be and stuff? But wouldn't that suck if you died and you're the one that's in there? Watch this. And, like, I guess you're always going to the bathroom all night long or something. Like, watch. I'm going to turn on the water. I'm going to flush the toilet. This is all I ever do. I mean, that would right. suck. I don't want to. I mean, if I'm going to be a ghost, I'd want to have more of a purpose. No. I want to be stuck at the salad bar in the hospital. I enjoy the salad bar. <laughs> you would know. He likes it that much. I do. What's your, what's your favorite uh, food at the, at the hospital? My favorite food? Yeah, favorite food at the hospital. Uh, at that hospital? Sure. Uh, oh, gosh. It was a little kind of crap. So. <laughs> 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 really? I'm going on a tangent. I, yeah. I would, actually, the salad bar was really good. See? So salad that, bars are good. Honestly, you, you made a good choice. My favorite thing was when I had the, my appendix uh, ruptured, and uh, then like the first thing that they bring to me the next morning right after, I'm like just coming out of you know my hazy state, and I'm doing a Facebook Live. Did anybody watch a Facebook Live? I remember, yeah. no, but I listened to yeah. it. Yeah, I'm like doing a like Facebook Live. Medicated yeah. Tony. Medicated Tony. Uh, <laughs> my concern was getting the EPP episode done for the week. Uh, I really was. I'm like, okay, if I'm dead, but here's the the stories are over um, that it was uh, they brought me a. Uh, Chicken fried steak. They did. A lot of gravy. And, uh, it's, it's I can't remember. Did you eat it? I did. Yeah. <laughs> and you kept it down? Yeah, I did another surgery later on. 
<laughs> I, I did keep it down, but yeah, it was, uh, it was like, it's probably not the best choice uh, at that moment in time. But uh, there you go. Was Jen around then? Because chicken fried steak. That uh, might have been just no, as good. No, I was chasing Harper around the hospital. But, you know, he, uh, he turned down your, your roommate had cookies. He kept wanting you to have his cookies. Oh, he was an interesting fellow. Yeah, he was special. I have a cookie. I got a little girl over here. I'd like to give her a cookie. <laughs> Can we pull the plug on that one, please? Are you still in Wichita when that happened? Okay. Uh, no, no, actually, that was in France. Oh, okay. So, there you go. Good times. <laughs> well, thank you for coming up and sharing your Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maria, the call from beyond. Let's hear it. Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'm here with my mom. Hi. <laughs> so, my mom's dad, my grandpa, he passed away in 1992, April of 1992, and he died from bone cancer. Um, but before, he, um, he'd been really sick for a long time, um, and he'd been seeing this doctor named Dr. Gordon. And uh, Dr. Gordon, uh, he'd go into the grandpa would go to see him, and he would tell him, oh, you just need to uh, exercise more. That's why uh, you, you keep breaking bones. You're not strong enough. You need to exercise more. Um, and my grandpa kept breaking bones. And so my mom kept telling him, I think something's wrong. I think you need to get a second opinion. This doesn't seem right. Um, so my grandpa finally went to see another doctor, Dr. Buchanan, and Dr. Buchanan diagnosed him with bone cancer. <clears throat> And so I don't remember how long after um, the diagnosis, but eventually he did die from the bone cancer. And so my mom was really upset. She thought about um, filing a malpractice lawsuit against Dr. Gordon for missing the diagnosis. Um, and then about two years passed by, um, and my dad got the newspaper one morning, and he brought it in and he said, oh, look, uh, on the front page of the newspaper it said, local doctor dies in a rock climbing accident in Peru. Um, and it was Dr. Gordon, the one that missed the diagnosis, the bone cancer diagnosis. And so my mom said, oh yeah, that's, that's the doctor that missed grandpa's diagnosis. Um, and we didn't think much more about it. Um, and then it was about the next day or two days later, um, my mom and I were in her bedroom. She was paying bills or something on the computer and I was just um, sitting there watching TV and the phone rang. This was like when caller IDs were still fairly new. Um, and the caller ID just said out of area. And so I answered the call, um, and there was a voice on the other end, but it was very staticky and almost like very moany. Um, and he said, this is the doctor for Arthur Garcia. And I said, yes, because <laughs> my grandpa was already dead I'm like two years at that point. Um, and he just kept repeating, this is the doctor for Arthur Garcia. This is the doctor for Arthur Garcia. And it just kept getting like more and more distant and like staticky and moany. And I think I turned completely white and was just looking at my mom like, and she finally grabbed the phone out of my hand and said, can I help you? And he just re kept repeating, this is the doctor for Arthur Garcia. This is the doctor for Arthur Garcia. And finally she asked, what do you want? And he just said, I'm sorry. And the phone went dead. Like, oh, I got the goosebumps that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. That was it. Did you call the hospital and go, hey, your dead doctor's calling you. <laughs> Is that new? Well, actually, my mom's brother is Art Jr., Arthur Jr., so she called him and just out of goodwill, and he said, yeah, he's dead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, is everything okay? You're yeah. not in the hospital by any chance. He's like, no, I'm fine. I'm here. Sure. Yeah. So That, that is bizarre. Yeah. That is crazy. See, I assumed the whole story, you had a twist. Yeah, because I thought it was going to be your grandfather calling, but the doctor calling. So, 
so, like, what's that all about? Like, he's just guilty? Like, he's trying to finish up his unfinished business and making it right with your family's probably on that list. But I like to think he felt guilty, and I hope I gave you some peace, you know? Oh. Well, I'm just raising my hand because I remember that story. Yes. Yes. It is on oh. the episode. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm the I just, right when you started talking about it, I was like, oh, I for sure heard that story, and I even told my family, I was like, he said I'm sorry. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> you, <laughs> you all have so much better memory than I do. <laughs> it's great. Everything is new to me every day. Yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful. Awesome. I'm to find it now. I called in like October of last year. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing this story. Really great story. Great story. At the moment, I don't know that you would do this because it's kind of probably overwhelming, but did you ever like try and call the number back or call her ID or? On a very, okay, so yeah, then you kind of get there. And that was back then when you actually would pick up a phone call that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> now I'm like, well, I don't know who that is. I can't answer that. What was the one where you could like call the number? Was it star 69? Was that yeah, which is a weird yeah. number. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why don't you call me? <laughs> uh, Alex Coleman. Navy Ghosts. Come on in. I think you guys were eating at the restaurant we were at tonight. You were across, yeah. You should have said hi. <laughs> You're not on display yet. <laughs> we have some extra slices of pizza. We could have given them to you. You know, great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, Alex. Let's hear your story. Okay. Um, I was in the Navy from 2001 to 2004. And just for clarity's sake, I'm trans, so I was in as a female, so pronouns don't match up, that's why. Okay. Um, but when I was in boot camp, uh, this is in Great Lakes, and pretty much it's one of the oldest boot camps that they had at the time. And uh, there are a lot of ghost stories around in the basic training, you know, and the RDCs, who are the Navy equivalent of drill sergeants. Love telling them. Um, because lots of stuff happens. Uh, there was a recruit who had, he was the uh, recruit division commander, he liked, uh, a recruit who was in charge of the other recruits, had had some misfortune back at home and had killed himself on his ceremonial sword, you know, the one you do the pass with you with. Um, one had, a petty officer had been sleeping with recruits, he got found out, he hung himself. So there's lots, lots of stories. But there was a story about a petty officer in white who would appear in our compartment. And I kept trying to chill the other recruits out because, you know, you're away from home from the first time, you're scared, you're on edge. And I know these, you know, the RDCs are just trying to screw with you and freak you out. So I'm like, you know, they're, they're just repeating these stories. You know, there may not be any merit to any of them. They're, uh, they're just trying to screw with you, but the other recruits are still on edge. Um, and especially, there's like, we hear screaming in the night. I'm like, does it sound like a division getting beat? <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're hearing screams on the pipes. That's another division upstairs. So um, I was pretty much the skeptic of the group, not because I'm, you know, trying to be skeptical, but just trying to chill everybody out. But um, finally, one night, I was standing the mid watch, and I was, you know, armed with my little flashlight, you know, trying to make sure nobody goes into a or doing anything they're not supposed to be. And I look as I'm kind of just staring up and down the apartment. It was strange because I was actually perfectly awake. Normally you're, you're a little groggy, but um, I looked down at the apartment and was just really startled because I suddenly realized that there was somebody looking between the racks back at me. And it was a male face. You know, this is a female apartment. Um, but it was very obviously not a living person. It, he was pale, had a very serious, kind of sad, somber expression, um, look up like a petty officer in his summer whites, standing between two of the racks. Um, and I kind of froze, because you know, you're taught to, uh, I was torn, because I'm like, I could watch, I'm supposed to take care of everybody, but like, what do you do at this point, you know? <laughs> they don't give you a lot of training for that, so. I kind of stood there for a moment like, I think I should do something, um, but then he was just gone. 
and I uh, I did a quick sweep, kind of looked under the rack to see, you know, okay, no retreating feet. I went up and down the corridors, checked behind the racks, checked the doors, everything was locked up. I mean, I knew when I was looking at that person, that is not a real person, you know, that is they're like kind of transparent. Um, and by the end of it, I'm like, okay, I'm unnerved. I think I'm going to go to the front of the compartment. And the uh, forward watch is like, what's wrong? And I told her, and she's like, you didn't tell me. So we both walked <coughs> all over again. Um, we did not tell the uh, officer on deck because we didn't want to end up in the psych ward. <laughs> we just wanted to, re you know, get through boot camp. We didn't want any holdups. So Wow. No, I was just, I, I was going to wonder, I, I, I've never served in the military, so my question to you is, when you go off to boot camp, is that a fearful experience? Are you afraid of what that's going to be like, or where you're going to go after boot camp, or any of that? Because I'm, I'm wondering how much fear just resonates in those barracks. Uh, there's a lot of fear. I mean, you realize at a certain point, pretty quickly, like, okay, they're not going to physically harm me. You know, they can yell at me, they can scare me, they can do all sorts of stuff. But it's like you're away from home, you've got these really unpleasant people yelling at you all the time. Um, you're physically exhausted, you have no idea what life is going to be like after that. You know, because after a while you get used to boot camp, but then you realize you're going to go off to the fleet. And once you're in the fleet, then you've got a lot of responsibility. You're popped in, this was 2002. By that point, in the story. So it's like we realized we were. This was the time of war. Yeah. So people didn't quite know what was going to happen. Wow. Just all that nervous energy. Mm -hmm. Just the. Because we hear stories like that, you know, quite often, where you can see in the barracks and things of that nature, where, you know, there's not even necessarily, you know, I mean, you did say there were some tragic things that happened there, but sometimes there is no tragedy, and it's just like, why is this? They can't trace it back to anything. People come, people go. But I think you're right. It, it probably goes a lot back to the, the energy of what, what's going on and when people are going through those experiences. Well, don't you think, too, a lot of people who serve in the military, it's like your identity. Mm -hmm. So if you pass, you want to be where you really identify with and scaring the crap out of people like you might have yeah. been a perk. <laughs> yeah. He's not going to give up that scaring people job. <laughs> Thank, thank, you you. Yeah. thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, creepy. Very. That yeah. was creepy. Yeah. That yeah. was creepy. Uh, I'm going to have to sleep tonight. And this damn yeah. hotel. <laughs> Seriously, I will never sleep. Have fun. Uh, <laughs> Where are you staying, Tony? Not here. <laughs> Tori. Uh, haunted Fort. Concha. Concho, did I say it right? Awesome. Concho. Concho. There you go. I have no idea what this is. I don't either. Well, I'll tell you what okay, it is. Okay, thanks. You're never going to find out. Yeah, so Fort Concho is one of the best restored forts in the nation. It is a post-Civil War fort located in good old San Angelo, Texas. Um, it housed the Buffalo Soldiers, our most famous colonel to um, look, there was Colonel Benjamin Grierson. He led a very um, successful raid. He was part of the Union Army. And then he got sent down to be in charge of the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, we were in Comanche territory, so he was doing Indian raids. And he brought his family with him. And um, it's kind of like a generational thing with me in Fort Concho. So my hauntings there started at a really young age. I had my third, um, third grade birthday party there. And we got to spend the night. Um, there's all these ghost stories about Fort Concho, by the way, like people have written books, there have been people who have come out, but um, it really got worse when I started working there in college. So when I was younger and I spent the night there, it's like door shutting, um, seeing people kind of walking by the barracks because we were staying in the barracks, which are known to be haunted. And then when I got to college, I started working in the archives. So part of the archives was reading through um, Alice's letters, so that's his wife. Um, the most second famous ghost at the fort is Edith, which is her daughter. She passed there when she was 12, I believe of TV, um, at Officer's Quarters 1. So in the archives, I was reading Alice's letter, and I was holding a necktie. So uh, my archivist was kind of with the theory that you can hold letters with your bare hands, which I thought was super cool, which you're probably not really supposed to do because of the oils on your fingers. But um, so I had the necktie in my hand before I was reading the letter. So I'm reading the letter, which is from like the 1800s, 
and she talks about Edith passing. And then she says, this is the necktie, because she was writing it to her son, Charles, who was away at some military academy. And she says, I've enclosed the necktie made from Edith's burial dress. So I'm like, okay, put that down. Um, and then weird stuff started happening after that. I would be housing books, because we had a rare book collection, and we had a library for researchers. So I'd be in there by myself working, and I'd be putting books on the shelves, and I'd walk down the aisle, and books would fly off that I had just put back. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna not do that anymore. Um, and then it just got real weird. So Edith has a death photo. I'm sure you know death photos were really popular at that time. So Edith dies, they take her death photo. Um, it was the day of the necktie story, and I called out to the archivist, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the necktie. And she's like, hey, you wanna see Edith's death photo? So I was like, sure, show me the death photo. Um, it was a really bad idea. It was that, it's like taken from an angle and Edith's eyes weren't all the way closed and it like really affected me. And that night I dreamed um, that it was Edith in bed and she sat up and she opened her eyes and she screamed my name out. And then from the rest of my internship I had reoccurring dreams about Edith. So I'd be in OQ1 and Edith would be there um, and she'd be pulling my hair or tugging at me. And then I'd go to work the next day and have to go to OQ1 and you would feel like the neck on your, your hair's on your neck stand up. And I'd be walking down the stairs and I'd say, okay, Edith, please don't touch me. Please don't push me. Um, and it wasn't until I um, graduated college and was out of that job that the dream stopped. So that's Edith and that's Fort Concho. Wow. Add it to your list of uh, places to visit there, Carol. I still want to go there. Yeah. We have such a but haunted history in the whole town. Can we back up? Did you say that when you were in third grade, yes. y'all went and spent that? What were your parents thinking? Um, like, this is a great idea. <laughs> so it was actually, I wanted to stay. There's a Bordello museum called Miss Hattie's, and I wanted to stay. Of course you wanted a Bordello, but they said, no, it's not appropriate. Um, That's brilliant. I love you. It's fourth grade. they do it um, but people have seen full body apparitions of her like they'll come to our office and we have a photo of her in like a peach dress and they're like oh I saw her I saw that little girl whose daughter is she and we're like no that's Edith <laughs> and she died like 100 years ago but it's crazy she'll talk to people it's it's the weirdest thing and it's been consistently going on like since she passed so it's a great great tour if you ever want to visit haunted San Angelo go to the fort go to Miss Hattie's because that's haunted too um, yeah, we're, we're a fun little Wild West town. That's like your Titanic to us. Yeah. Right, that's your your special thing that called to you as a young age. At a young age, yeah, yeah. Those, those darn ghosts. I mean, doors, like we have it. My grandma at that third birthday interviewed me alone in the barracks before, and on camera she has where it's just me and her, and the door shuts behind her, and there's no wind, there's no nothing. Like, yeah, it's just, it's always been part of my story as me and Fort Concho for some weird reason. That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah, it's really cool to have that. Yeah, because we, we're kind of obsessed with Titanic. Yeah, yeah. It, it's something that calls you. Everybody has that yeah. one thing, you know, and it, it could be a fort, you know, and that's kind of an unusual place for a little girl to have her birthday party, but I get it. <laughs> I totally get yeah. it. Your it daughter is so going to ask for something like that yeah. in the third You know, my daughter wants to share with a limo and a pizza party. That's all she wants. She doesn't want a party. She just wants the four of us to ride around a limo with a pizza. Because yeah. she saw it on Home Alone too. And so I said, I'm like, do you want a gift? No. I just she's like, the, you can. She's like, I have such a great life. I'm not even kidding. She's, she's yeah, the most grateful like, little thing in the like world. That. I have such a great be such a great life. I would just love that the the ride and to have the pizza and to be with family. And, and I know. Like, it's like. She the limo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She sets you up. She's a smart kid. She's like, oh, I love you, Daddy, but I really want a limo ride. <laughs> <laughs> and five hundred dollars. No. 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 Yeah. And she is. She, she's just so grateful. It's it's like, who's writing your script of being the perfect full house daughter? You know. Yeah. <laughs> so we have this other sort of dog comic that shows up. It's really weird. Not the Jesse will come out. It's, it's like, yeah. Thank you for Thank coming you. up and sharing this story. Thank you. Uh, Emily, Emily Brown, they followed him home. Oh. Yes. That's a really good title. Welcome. Here you go. Thank you, short girl, getting one of our 
is still always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear your story, Emily. So first off, I've lived in haunted places. I've worked in three haunted places, so always interesting and fun. My brother is part of a ghost hunting group. He now lives in Arizona, so he was going between Arkansas and Arizona at this time. So he returned home shortly after our mother had passed. And the last thing that he did before he got on the plane was he and his ghost hunting crew went to Jerome, Arizona. Always a good place to go. Um, that girl from Arizona is like, oh yeah, yeah. that's a good place. Yeah, yeah, definitely not on my to-do list. <laughs> well, he gets home, he's like, you know what, I'm going out with friends, have fun. I'm home alone, it's me and the dog, that's it. And I'm in my office working because I was on deadline. Well, I'm just staring at the computer trying to get some writing done. And my dog, who is the quietest dog in the world, never barked, never growled, nothing, just starts growling. That low and the throat guttural growl that big dogs do. Yeah. I'm looking at this dog, like, what the hell are you doing? And then she gets up around the office and then gets to the doorway and she looks out toward the living room and just starts barking. Like, somebody's in my house barking. Ruff on the back of her collar was up. Okay. So I get up and I'm looking. There's nothing there. Alright. So I walk out into the living room. As soon as I get out into the living room, I hear this deep and malevolent laugh. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> This is unusual even for me. <laughs> Flip on the light and I'm like, there's nothing here. Well, you can hear, you can kind of judge distance by the sound. This laugh came from the, the, the ceiling of the house. And I'm looking around and as I'm looking, the air kind of gets denser and denser and denser. And there's nothing there, but it's almost like this, you can almost see like a mirage where the air is just real dense. You can almost touch it. There was nothing there. I'm like, this is not your house, you need to leave. Well, it laughs again, and I'm like, this is bullshit, I don't have time <laughs> So I turn around, trying not to run, get back into the office, and I'm like, I'm not moving <laughs> for the rest of the night. Well, the dog lays at the threshold and does not move for like three hours. By this time, I'm ready to get out of this office. Well, she finally hops up onto the sofa behind me and falls asleep and like this energy that it kind of like just wafted in slowly dissipated. I told my brother this, let's just say smudging was definitely the first thing on the list. So I told him he's not allowed to act the house until he's been smudged from now on. That was, <laughs> nothing happened after that, but when it was happening, it sure scared the piss out of me. <laughs> Every time he comes down, have you smudged? <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's like, do I need to get out the holy water now? It's like when they go to like one of those rooms like that, like the dust free, and you have to whatever it is where they decontaminate you. Static yeah, free room. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so smudge your way up. It, 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 was gone. it, it just, it just, apparently, it just wanted to freak me out, and I was like, I'm not this. I don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was like that. I got time to eat. I have the one running out the door, screaming. Like, I can't do that. Well, it didn't harm me physically, so I was like, until you start throwing stuff at me, I'm It was a malevolent laugh, though. That's yeah, enough that, for me. It's like, I, yeah, I've had stuff thrown at me. I've been almost pushed down the stairs before the, the last No, That doesn't freak me out. You're so much braver than I am. Like, you are way more braver. If I get to haunt people someday, I'm, I'm, I can do a good level of laugh because I do all those haunted house commercials. Yeah, so I'm yeah. always doing a creepy laugh. And you have a creepy guy voice too. Yeah, like if I can pitch my voice when I'm dead, it'll be great. It'll make it really like, that's a guy in the haunted house. And once you're dead, you can do any kind of pitch with your voice. Awesome. I can't wait. I just hope that's not a residual after you're gone. I just hear your haunted house laugh. <laughs> 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 and then Jen's gonna be like, I ain't got time for shit. <laughs> Thank you for coming up and sharing your stories. <laughs> Ladon, Haunted Hospital Room. Here you go. Alright. Let's 
hear your ghost story. So another haunted hospital ghost story. If you guys ever want to hear a scary story, just find a nurse because we all got it. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so this was late 90s, early 2000s. I was a student nurse, probably like 19, 20 years old, something like that. And I live in Oklahoma. It was spring, so spring in the Midwest is tornado stormy season. And it happened that we, I was on a wing that had only 20 rooms, and we had about five patients that night. So it's a slow night. I'm sitting in, we had a nurse's um, kind of like break room that was on the same floor as the patients. And the nurses on duty were talking about Charlie. And they were like, we're probably going to see Charlie tonight. And I'm this young, arrogant, 19, 20 year old, I'm like, who's Charlie? Well, he's the ghost that haunts this floor. And I was kind of annoyed with them, actually. I'm like, it's so cliche. Like, we're in a hospital, it's stormy tonight, you guys want to tell me ghost stories. And I kind of ignored it. So, later in the night, <coughs> this is like a sequence from a scary movie, because like, when something scary happens, there's no freaking people around. <laughs> what you see is the apparition, right? It was like so, so cliche, but I was in the hallway charting on a patient, and all of our patients were we kind of had them huddled up towards the front of the hall where that break room was. Um, but in my peripheral vision, I see like a body come out into the hallway. So I'm partying, and I see this, this figure getting closer to me. So I kind of turn, and I look, and it's a figure of a patient in a hospital gown. So I'm thinking in my mind, what in the world? Like, I know there's not any patients down there. I keep charting and the apparition starts moving closer to me and at this point I'm kind of freaking out I'm thinking about the stories they were telling me. So I finish my charting rather quickly and I run, <laughs> I run and hide in that break room. And so I'm kind of like peeping around the corner to see what's going to happen. And sure enough, this patient, like this apparition, goes past the doorway. So I just kind of stand there and I wait quietly and when he passes the doorway, step out and I kind of peek around the corner and he goes to the end of the hall and he stops for a moment and then he makes a left hand turn and, and proceeds down the next hallway. So for those of you who've never worked in a hospital, there is no way a hospital is going to let a patient walk alone it's because that's a liability. You have a therapist or you have a nurse ambulating patients down the hall. So I kind of let it go and I get busy. Later in the night the nurses come back to the break room and they sit down. And I was like, um, do you guys have a patient in hall or in room 217? And they looked at me funny and they were like, let's take a trip down to room 217. So they took me down there and flipped the line on. The bed is made, like it's perfectly clean. There has been no patient in that room and they said, you saw Charlie. So that was pretty crazy. <laughs> was Charlie known to come out of that room? He was known to come out of the room. So, you know, earlier in the conversation, I was kind of ignoring them. That was actually the haunted room they were referring to. So we did see Charlie that night. That's crazy. <laughs> the hall that he turned down, was a salad bar at the end of that? <laughs> 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 no. Might have been. No. I also am concerned because I remember they let me walk around the hospital by myself. Thank you for sharing your story. Yeah,